SCP-8041 Supreme Nothing Item Number 8041 Containment Class Safe Special Containment Procedures As of time of writing, there are no recommended containment procedures for SCP-8041. SCP-8041-1 is currently remanded at Site-19. All research staff assigned to its containment are to be given refresher sessions on the nature of SCP-8041 and SCP-8041-1 with standard onboarding materials every five days to ensure efficacy of containment. All photographic and written evidence referring to or depicting SCP-8041-1, including this article and all attached addendums, is subject to ongoing cognitohazardous properties that act as a cognitohazardous half-life resulting from a use of SCP-8041-1 sometime in the past. As a result of these properties, all evidence relating to SCP-8041-1 automatically self-effaces over a period of around 6 minutes. All documentation relating to SCP-8041-1 should be reloaded regularly when viewing digitally to mitigate the impact of this effect. Automated photocopying systems have been set up on site to ensure the preservation of evidence pertaining to SCP-8041-1. Description, SCP-8041 is the apparent lack of archaeological and paleontological evidence of anomalies prior to the mid-16th century. An exact date of SCP-8041's origin is not currently confirmed, although Foundation researchers within the Anomalogenesis Department currently suggest 1527 as the year in which anomalies as the Foundation understands them came into existence. While SCP-8041's existence has been apparent for a large part of the Foundation's history, its existence as an anomaly in itself was first hypothesis by Foundation researcher Dr. Victor T. Toff in his lecture, How Have We Become Masters of the Unreal, delivered to junior Foundation researchers on 4 June, 1998, an excerpt from which is attached here in addendum a. This lecture caused a stir in the Foundation's research community. However Dr. Titov was killed by a bus crash while holidaying at Lake Huron in 2002, and so the field of anomalogenesis remained largely unexplored. One. Dr. Titov's line of work was later codified in the creation of the anomalogenesis department, after junior foundation researcher Dr. Lauren Hiskey suggested its practical importance in maintaining the veil in her own paper. Predictive methods and Lazarus tax are in foundation operations, excerpts from which are attached in addendum B.2 as a result of the paper's success. Dr. Hiskey was awarded a research grant and made chair of the anomalogenesis department, which at that time consisted of only her. During a period of extended leave due to an ongoing internal financial review, Dr. Hiskey discovered an extremely promising invoice for a transaction dated the 5th of November, 1499 addressed to wealthy Venetian merchant Alexander Dodario and forwarded it to fellow researcher and department member Dr. Bradley Mungsu.3 The invoice, translated from its original Venetian, is available in Addendum C. After failing to have the invoice investigated through official channels, Dr. Hiskey privately collaborated with security chief Patricia Ravon using the remainder of her research grant to conduct a physical investigation of La Cavalla Bianca, a boarding house mentioned in Dodario's personal correspondence as lodging for Dodario's frequent trips to Rome, referred to by Dodario as pilgrimage. During this investigation, a large, empty book with cognitohazardous properties designated as SCP-8041-1 was discovered and later remanded into Foundation custody. Description of gathered photographic evidence is available below in Addendum D, including copies of the initial photographs of SCP-8041-1. Both official write-ups by Dr. Hiskey and Security Chief Ravon were lost as a result of the cognitohazardous properties of SCP-8041-1. Addendums Addendum A, excerpt from How Have We Become Masters of the Unreal. How Have We Become Masters of the Unreal? Date the 4th of June, 1998. Note, full lecture transcript available on request. D.R.T. Tov, the crux, then, is this. It takes the collected resources of our foundation, a titanic, and well-oiled bureaucratic machine with resources spanning nations, to effectively contain many Kitter-class objects. And even without the widespread havoc that the Kitter-class might have wreaked upon the sparse townships and divided, tribal states of early mankind, even safe and Euclid classes would, logically, have a historic tradition that was widespread and well documented. This seemingly impossible gap in the paleontological and archaeological records must have an explanation. 
the theories surrounding this gap are limitless. Perhaps an unknown event somehow damaged the background Hume levels of our reality to such a severe degree that the objects and beings that we study were able to come into existence, or that the seemingly impossible nature of anomalous objects has a degenerating, mimetic effect on the human psyche, that causes, over time, anything that does not conform to preconceived notions of reality to be sectioned into the realm of myth and legend, if it is not placed under continued study. Perhaps even an inversion constitutes an inversion of the first, an event that retroactively removes evidence of any anomalous objects from the record of reality, retaining their cultural footprint, but obliterating the physical record to such an extreme degree that they are consigned, once again, to the realm of myth. Regardless of result, the question of the beginnings of our field of study, a question that I am dubbing, for my own purposes, anomalogenesis, is a fascinating area to which I only hope the Foundation will pay due attention. Addendum B, excerpt from Dr. Hiskey's Predictive Methods and Lazarus Taxar in Foundation Operations. Predictive Methods and Lazarus Taxar in Foundation Operations. Date, the 3rd of March, 2002. The applications of the Lazarus Taxon framework to Foundation field operations reveals boundless possibilities. The apparent gap in the biological record of any life forms that the Foundation would consider worthy of study may not be, as previously theorized, a result of late-stage anomalogenesis in our reality, but instead a product of paranormal factors that resulted in a temporary lapse. The upshot here is that many anomalies currently on record may not be occurrences, but reoccurrences. It is possible that many of these anomalies have existed before, perhaps during a period of oral tradition, prior to a written one. In fact, there is potential that this absence, like any other conspicuous mystery, is itself worthy of study as a potential cognito hazard, obscuring the existence of anomalies that did, in fact, exist. Regardless, the assertion that anomalies as we understand them simply came into existence spontaneously is one that is short-sighted at best and dangerous at worst. What began as an area of Dr. Titov's academic interest may now be of the utmost importance. Addendum C, Invoice for Transit Completed I write to invoice for the payment of 800 golden ducats, as agreed upon by myself and the esteemed contractor, for the careful and delicate delivery of one beauteous caryatid, of the finest make and lifelike detail, crafted of the finest wood, from the wooded grove upon the banks of the banks of the Brenta to the city walls of Venice under cover of darkness, whereupon it was duteously delivered to an agent of the contractor without delay. I write to invoice for the payment of 800 golden ducats, as agreed upon by myself and the esteemed contractor, for the careful and delicate delivery of one beauteous caryatid, of the finest make and lifelike detail, crafted of the finest wood, from the wooded grove upon the banks of the banks of the Brenta to the city walls of Venice under cover of darkness, whereupon it was duteously delivered to an agent of the contractor without delay. Addendum D, Evidence Collected by Security Chief Ravon this addendum details selected descriptions of photographic evidence gathered during Security Chief Ravon's inspection into La Cavalla Bianca. A full photographic archive with visual descriptions is available on request from Security Chief Ravon pending appropriate clearance. Article 1, a well-lit photograph of a stone tunnel entrance. The tunnel and stairs are constructed of cut stone, rather than being carved into the rock. Above the tunnel entrance is carved, in Latin. Corinthians 4.1, a man should account us in this way, as servants of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Quality of the stonework is intricate and exquisite. Article 4, a photograph of the stairway's exit, a cut stone doorway, lit by camera flash. Above the door is etched an image of a rose sporting an open eye on each petal, as well as two Latin phrases. First, Wardens of the Divine Mysteries and Second, Ecclesiastes 12:14. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret, whether it is good or evil. Article 12, a photograph of a large hall, with cut stone tunnels leading off at regular intervals. The photograph is lit by a camera flash. The hall is punctuated by the wrecks of fallen brass chandeliers, also extremely well crafted. The aforementioned rose symbol is carved into the stone in faded color at regular intervals. Article 15, a wide shot of a large pelt, visible in Article 12. The pelt consists of primarily leopard-like skin and fur, but develops into scales towards the pelt's head, and exhibits servine features at the outer extremities. Article 30, small hallway containing seven doorways, each with metal bars. 
Each room contains manacles, and decayed humanoid skeletons, notable for extremely high bone density and heights ranging between 97 and 125 centimeters. Article 32, an etched metal plaque, unintelligible due to dirt and wear. Article 33, the same plaque, now cleaned on site by security chief Ravon. A Latin inscription reads subjects should not be allowed access to stoneworking materials, hammers, or tools of any kind. A routine inspection of cells for escape tunnels should be performed weekly. Article 47, a large chamber, containing rusted monocles 4 inches thick, and over 70 centimeters in diameter. A brass plaque is visible, but unintelligible. Article 65, a small chamber, containing a manacled figure. The figure is extremely emaciated, with pointed ears, stark white hair, and grey, desiccated skin, but according to security chief Ravon, still breathing, although unresponsive. Article 66, an etched metal plaque, cleaned on site by security chief Ravon, outside of the cell door, above which is hung a horseshoe. The inscription reads due to an observed ability to slip outside of this realm, subject should be kept incarcerated using wrought iron only to prevent potential escape attempts. Horseshoe is not to be removed. Article 71, a stone chamber, containing a plot of irrigated dirt, with evidence of an irrigation system no longer in use. At the center of the chamber is a rotted tree stump, from which extends the haft of an axe. Articles 103 to 110, various yellowed, vellum pages of a small notebook. The text, written in Latin, appears to be in a stenographic shorthand. The text is photographically available on demand from Archive 112, and recreated in full here. 4th of August, 15,274. This meeting shall now come to order. Opening prayers and greetings commence. A worried air is prevalent in the meeting room. Various members are not in attendance. Ceremonies begin officially with a prayer and silent vigil for those members who lost their lives in the battle. DD, gentlemen. I feel that I should first quell some concerns. It is true that the prior secrecy of our sanctum was breached in the fighting. However, in my capacity, I saw that it was handled. Those who breached the tunnel pose no threat to our furtive activities now. AA, enemy combatants. Mercenaries. Even if they were seen off, those parasites loot everything that isn't nailed down. Have you checked the archive? Searched their bodies for pilfered artifacts. DD, not combatants. Their disappearances will be easily explained by the fighting. I have taken all necessary steps. The assembled members murmur agreement, and appreciation. CA, regardless, if it has happened once, it shall happen again. If the League is able to install a new force in the papal seat, there is no telling what he will know of us. The destruction leveled upon the city is too widespread to expect this faked to continue much longer without discovery. It is imperative that we formulate a plan. I propose Madrid, we have substantial interests there and. SM descents, nonsense. The logistics are utterly impractical. Staying our ground is the only option. I refuse to cede anything to these Lutherans. CA, to cede is one thing. Retreat is another. Flight has often been the holy path, Matthew speaks of the Virgin's flight to Egypt to protect her son from the wrath of Herod. There is precedent. We must not allow pride to cloud our judgment. A nods in agreement, we must not look back. This great city cowers and quakes at its invaders, there is no shred of holiness left. DD, but where? The scope of our operations are too large. Before, there was no safer place in all Christendom than Rome. We can hardly take them across the Alps without being noticed. CA, what about the new world? It's away from scrutiny. We could build our own vaults, our own society. Use the grimoire to. SM, the risk is overwhelming. What lies on that continent could be even more dangerous than what we already have. Besides, the logistics of a long sea voyage are perilous even for experienced sailors. It would surely be fatal for our subjects. K.I., sailors are intolerable gossips. The room nods in agreement. There is a pregnant silence. K.I. speaks once again. K.I., Muscovy. D.D., the journey is too long, 
the winter's too harsh. C.A., there is nowhere we can flee to. A.A., then we must stay. There is much dissent and speech within the room. Murmured complaints are heard, and furtive defense from A.A. G.A., there can be no misconceptions here. To remain in Rome with the subjects in our possession is unconscionable. This city is not safe, and allowing our subjects to be used in war could be catastrophic. Subject 1's expertise in artifice, 3s raw destructive power, if they come to be possessed by the armies of the world, there is no telling what would happen. We swore to be God's stewards, not his armorers. Foot, there is nothing for it, then. We cannot move them, and we cannot keep them. We must hide them from the prying eyes of history, if not within the annals of these halls, then within the vaults of myth. Article 111, the final page of the notebook. It reads, let these mysteries fade from the view of the superstitious and unholy, and let them be the purview only of learned men. Article 120, a wide shot, lit by camera flash, of a large library. No books remain on the shelves, which are covered in dust and cobwebs, and made of rotted wood. At the center stands a lectern, adorned with the rose symbol. A large book, later designated as SCP-8041-1, surrounded by unlit, dribbling candles and bound with a tough, brown material, sits open on the lectern. Its pages appear blank. End log. Addendum E. Post-operative interview with security chief Ravon conducted by Dr. K. Unarathan. Date, the 4th of July, 2004. Note, security chief Ravon passed all preliminary psychological evaluations with flying colors. Begin log. Dr. Kaya Unarathan, hello, Patricia. Thank you for your initiative in taking on that assignment. I just wanted to go through some of the things that you uncovered in here, for the official record. Dr. Kaya Unarathan indicates a slim folder, containing the photographic evidence gathered by Security Chief Ravon. Ravon registers this, and nods in agreement. Ravon, of course. I'm happy to answer. Dr. Kaya Unarathan displays Article 1. Dr. K. Unarathan, all right. This symbol here. I'm aware you're not familiar with Latin, but what does this rose thing look like to you? What emotions did it instill? Ravon, I don't know. I definitely felt a bit uneasy, but that was just a product of the environment. You know, dark tunnel, solo mission. Bit creeped out. Just made me feel like I was being watched. Dr. K. Unarathan nods and reaches into the folder. Preliminary conversation regarding standard images and the details of the investigation continues. Dr. K. Unarathan presents Article 15. Dot. Dr. K. Unarathan, so, this pelt rug. Any reactions to that? Ravon, no. It's dusty, and old, but it fits in with the decor of the place. You know. Antiquated. Dr. K. Unarathan, nothing strange at all. It displays features of multiple types of animal, and there's no evidence of it being altered at all. You were clearly intrigued by it, look, you took a few close-ups of the extremities. Dr. K. Unarathan produces Article 16 through 22, which feature close-ups of the pelt rug depicted in Article 15. Ravon, I'm not sure. I guess I was just impressed by it in the moment, but it doesn't seem too weird now. Probably just some really good needlework. Dr. K. Unarathan, home okay. More discussion about Ravon's descent resumes. Dr. K. Unarathan produces Article 30, and places it on the table. Dot. Dr. K. Unarathan, so, what about these figures? Remind you of anything? Ravon, not really. I felt sad, the poor bastards. Kept locked up down here. This secret society seems to have been kidnapping people, abusing them or something. Made me mad, seeing how short they were, probably malnourished kids. Dr. K. Unarathan, so nothing about this struck you as anomalous or fantastical. Short, stout skeletons of people kept underground and prohibited access to stoneworking equipment. Ravon, no I guess the stoneworking was to stop them escaping. Probably just kids with some bone condition. Dr. K. Unarathan is visibly frustrated at this point. He begins to flick ahead through the folder of photographic evidence. 
he produces articles 65 and 66. Dr. K. Unarathan, what about this? This figure. Ravan, oh yeah, there was a prisoner, still alive in there. Pretty surprising. I was brooking it, I thought I was the only one still alive in there, so as soon as I heard the breathing, I backed up turned my safety off, tried to proceed with caution. I guess if there were people in there they must have heard me and run, cause he was the only living one in there. Looked pretty worse for wear, too. That made me mad. Probably hadn't seen sunlight in a while. Dr. K. Unarath, surprised. The place hasn't been explored in what looks like 500 years. Ravan, well, I don't know. That kind of stuff happens. Maybe he got put in there after all the others left. Dr. K. Unarath, and the horseshoe. The slipping referenced on the plaque. None of this is strange to you. Ravan, well, these guys were not cases that ran this vault thing. That much is clear. I didn't put much stock in the horseshoe. Maybe it was a converted stable. Dr. K. Unarath, are you serious? You took a close-up picture of the horseshoe immediately after. Dr. K. Unarath produces Article 67, a close-up image of the horseshoe. Dot. Dr. K. Unarath, use your head, man. This is clearly some sort of fairy. Ravon visibly cracks a smile, and snorts with laughter. Dot. Dr. K. Unarath, what's so funny? Ravon, well, you know. Fairies. That stuff's impossible. It doesn't exist. This is a place of science, don't go on about that stuff. I thought you were supposed to be a doctor. Dr. K. Unarath, are you aware of where you are? What we do in this foundation? Ravon, yeah, sure. But fairies aren't real. Dr. K. Unarath, oh, for Christ's sake. Let me 